Hello, everybody, and happy Friday, and welcome to Big Blue Kickoff Live, presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York football giants. John Schmelk, Paul Dottino with you. The phone number is 201-939-4513, hashtag Giants Chat on Twitter. If you prefer to get in touch with us that way, you certainly can. Busy week. And, Paul, I think both of us at this point have had the chance to basically comment on all the moves. Have you have you missed out on a chance to talk about any of the particular moves? I, I've gotten to all of them. I was on yesterday. Have you missed any? Uh, well, I wasn't on yesterday, so I'm back today. And I think I've pretty much hit them all, but there's probably a couple that trickled in. We'll get to them later on. I don't need to really pontificate. And the this. most recent news, uh, the Giants tender and bring back Nick McLeod. They did yeah. the same for Lawrence Cager. Jack Stoll is a part-time blocking tight end from Philadelphia. Philadelphia um, is, is somebody that reportedly that they've signed. I'm not sure if that's official yet, but according to reports, he's he's inbound. Right. So, you know, that's kind of where they are right now. And I thought, Paul, today would be a good show to kind of see where this leaves the roster currently. And yeah. then what's next? And obviously you guys can still call up and talk about the players they've signed and all that stuff or, uh, and, and everything like that. Real quick before we start, though, Paul, what do you, you should mention Aaron Donald announced his retirement today. Wow. Uh, probably from... I was a little young for LT. You know, LT retired, what, 93? LT retired That was his last season, So I was 12. So I don't have a great... I remember him, but I don't have, like, a great... Totally different position. Feel, I'm talking about just top defensive players of all oh. time I'm talking about here. Yeah. So I don't remember LT. So in terms of players that were as... He's probably a top three dominant defensive player that I've ever seen. In terms of really uh, to dominate a game and just being completely unblockable. You know, in recent memory, and I'll go with your time frame, I, I, it's unfair to, to go back to, to my old days because you weren't around to see them. Last but, 30 years, let's say. But but I think I think you'll be okay if I tell you Lawrence Taylor and Reggie White. I have no problem with either one of those guys. Okay. That's cool. And you can even throw like Bruce Smith into that conversation you know, if you want. Bruce, Bruce Smith is, is, if he's not sitting at the table, uh, he, he's right on the side of the table. And Derek Thomas, I you think, know. is kind of the, the the level right below that. I'd say, yeah. I mean, Ed yeah. Reed, completely different position, but completely he was different position, but cr- a, a incredibly great, dominant. Great def- and Deion Sanders, obviously, a corner. He would be the other guy that, in terms of dominant players, as yeah. just un like untouchable at his spot. That would be the other guy to me in the last thirty years that stands out. And then you know, if you want, you can get into the middle linebacker types. You can get into the Luke Keekley types and, and those types of guys if you want, but. That's the group for me. The the back room at the Hall of Fame, all right, the one that should be reserved for just a handful of guys, Aaron Donald can certainly uh, not be at all, at all out of that conversation. Uh, when you talk about that back room with the real elite guys, his name's going to have to come up there. It's just going to have to because, you know, I've always said, John, that Lawrence Taylor def- redefined the position and, heck, he forced offenses to actually create new plays and schemes just because of him, yeah. which I'm sorry, that makes him the number one defensive player of all time. Not just because they went away from him or because, oh, we got to worry about him. You know, he's the game wrecker. No, no. They created new portions of the playbook and schemes just because of him. So he will always be, as far as I'm concerned, at the top of Mount Rushmore of defensive players. No argument. But there's going to be a handful of guys who can get into that room, in that back room of the Hall of Fame. And Aaron Donald, the thing about him, John, you were just talking about it with Pearson before the program. And I said to you, my knock on him coming out of pit wasn't his ability. It was how is he going to be durable enough to play at such a high level in this league knowing that he was more svelte. He was more on the smaller side. Great athlete. We knew that. But how's he going to hold up? Yeah. I am I am absolutely flummoxed that he was able to play at this level for so long and rarely miss a game. I don't even know. Did we check how many games he missed? I I'm did not. Check. Why don't you I'm check, check right now? And Pearson, I thought, made a really good point. Much like with LT, then you started getting these like undersized edge yes. rushers. Now you have guys that are built. Teams are more willing to draft smaller defensive tackles because of what Aaron Donald did. And you go back, and it's kind of like a thing of lore, where at the Senior Bowl, the year he was drafted, which is what, 2014? Yeah. Him and Zach Martin went one-on-one. And Zach Martin dominated everybody that week, except for one dude. That guy. 
That's how good he was. And Zach Martin's really good. Zach Martin's going to be one of the best guards in the history of the league. So, I mean, but but to your point, as I was trying to get to before, is that Donald, because of his impact in this league, people started saying, well, three techniques can be now more athletic. They can be yeah. a little smaller. They mm-hmm. can be a little more slender. Just like after LT, everybody wanted the next pass rushing outside linebacker. They wanted the next 56. And they never found one. I don't know if they're going to be lucky enough to find an Aaron Donald either. No, he's one of one. He's one of one. So he's that special of a player. Anyway, wanted to get that out there before we got to your calls here at 201 939 4513. So in 2022, he missed six games. I guess he had an ankle injury. So okay. Is that is that all in 10 years? Six games? Uh, look, he played There's 14 games in 2017. 2014, he only played 12. Well, game started was twelve. Game. He did play played 16. sixteen. Game started. Oh, played yeah. sixteen. I'm looking at his at his track record now. Yeah, it looks so like just, yeah, that's it. Two and, then, and seventeen, and then one game last year he missed because that was a seventeen game season. Yeah, I right? mean, that's uh, you know. So he's missed eight games in his career. Nine I mean, games in his career. That's for a defensive how, lineman. That's ridiculous. And and John made a great point to me right before the show. John, what was that video? I want to see how many times he was top five defensive player of the year. So defensive player. <laughs> no, I'm serious. <laughs> defensive player of the year four times. <laughs> Otherwise, he was top five eight times. Amazing. Defensive player of the Just year. Just amazing. It's ridiculous. So so I was talking about his durability, and John said to me right before the show, he goes, well, when you're that small and that's felt, maybe guys can't get a good lick at you. And maybe that was the secret. And by the way, that athletic. Yeah. Like, he, yeah, he, you just can't get a hand on him. And he's powerful. The guards in this league, especially in recent years, maybe not his whole career, but in the last half of his career, guards have become more bigger and more powerful. They've become more road grader types. Well, and I think, well, I think guards have also had to become more athletic to deal they with have guys like Donald. Because of him. Right, exactly. Teams teams want to do that kind of stuff to Not them now. You. So anyway, right. just great, great, great player. All right, so looking ahead now, here we go. Giants, we've seen what they've done, okay? I will summarize this quickly for everybody. Okay. All right. They land a running back to replace Saquon Barkley. Now, more, probably more of a part-time back than Barkley well, was. Different direction. They're going committee. But they have a they have a starter they have in somebody. place. Okay? They have somebody. Offensive line. They had two guys that can be starters. Yep. And talking to Jermaine Illuminar yesterday, and that interview is going up at some point today. Holy cow! It is one of the favorite. It was one of my favorite interviews I've ever, I've ever done here. It was unbelievable. He was great. It's 17 minutes. So that, that's going up on the Giants Huddle Podcast, also the Giants YouTube channel at some point today. Make sure you please go check that out. He could start at any of four spots on the offensive line. He told me mm-hmm. he doesn't care. He can do any of the four. Mm-hmm. He's just as comfortable in all of them. And, and that's up there on, on YouTube. And he, why uh, he, he was such interview. a target of mine. Runyon, John Runyon, a starter at left guard, right guard. Right. Either one. He said he's probably feels like he's more of a natural left guard, but he's been at he right did. guard long enough now where he's fine. He's played. He started the last two years. So that's not a position change. He's played there the last two years. He'll be fine at right guard. So they try to secure the offensive line. You replace the running back. And then on defense, you bring in the big pass rusher and Brian Burns, obviously. Mm-hmm. And those are your major additions. You have some guys on the periphery. But those are your major additions in terms of guys that you brought in. Jalen Mills, who can kind of be a combo slot, safety, box type of guy. That'll Secondary probably, wild card. How about that? He'll be in the mix to make up for some of those Xavier McKinney snaps you're losing out on. So the question is, what's left? When you take a look here, where are your holes? Paul, I'll let you lead us off if you want to bet first. Yeah, I, I just think that it's obvious that also you forgot the quarterback. They got the insurance quarterback. Yes, and Drew Locke, and Drew Locke is the backup quarterback. Thank you. I did Because a, a lot of people will, might come at that right away. And we should... Thank you. Before we get into our conversation, please let's bring this up. So, John Schneider said last night on a Seattle radio station, I believe, correct? Yes, yes. That Drew Locke came to the Giants because the Giants told him that he can compete for the starting spot here. You want to read the quote? No, you can. You can read it. I don't have it in front of me because I, I thought no, it was I ridiculous it. when I read it. I took it. So, as a, I took the quote. No, not not Schneider's quote. I was talking oh, about Locke's, Drew Locke's quote. quote. Oh, I mean, yeah, you can go ahead and read it. Daniel Jones is the starter on this team, and that's been conveyed to me. He's here to push Daniel Jones as a backup, not here to compete with him for a starting spot. Correct. And he made it very clear that he never talked to Schneider out in Seattle about a scenario that it mimics the Baker Mayfield thing. He said I, that never ne- never came up. And he said, I just said to him, I'm getting a one-year deal, 
He said, great, fine, end of conversation. So It sounds I'm, like John Schneider's trying to come up with a justification for why they did not retain him. And that happens a lot of times yeah, when it. GMs lose guys, right? right? So, hey, it is what it is. The point is, don't read anything into the the reports that you saw last night off of Schneider's, Schneider's comments because Drew Locke is clearly saying that uh, there's really nothing there. No. Okay. Daniel Jones is a starter in week one. That's it. Anyway. All right. Well, hole number one. Go ahead. Yeah. For me, it's it's still got to be the impact wide receiver. I, I'm still going there, and it's so, 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 so fortunate for the Giants that unless, like, something happens to the planet before the draft, <laughs> there's going to be two, probably one, but maybe two. At least one, maybe two. Right. Is the way I'd put Superstar it. Superstar impact receiving prospects should be there at six. Agreed. And I think when you're picking at six and you can look ahead to the draft a little bit, you can adjust your plan accordingly. You know, at six, you have a pretty good idea of who's going to be there and who's not. Right. I think you can say with some level of safety that three quarterbacks will go ahead of the Giants. Now, where those three quarterbacks go, what teams select them, if more than three go, all of that's possible. Team trades up. You saw the Vikings trade today. They traded their two second-round picks for an extra first-round pick this year. Now they own 11 and 23. And the Vikings are looking for a quarterback in last year's draft. So they're going to be looking to t package those picks to move up. Whether that's the Patriots, whether that's the Cardinals, whether that's the Chargers. Could even be the Raiders moving up. Correct. So three or four quarterbacks will go ahead of the Giants. Can't tell you for sure who's picking them. I can tell you pretty sure that the Commanders are picking one and that the <laughs> Bears are picking one. And, and the Patriots. Well, maybe not. Maybe the Patriots. Maybe not. Are, but maybe that's the team that moves out and the team moves in. I think they'd be crazy not to, my opinion. Yeah. I don't know what they're thinking up there. Uh, they do have Jacoby Brissett there as a stopgap in case they don't draft a quarterback. But the bottom line, with three quarterbacks in some way, shape, or form going before the Giants, that only leaves three picks. And there's three premium wide receivers. So right. the Giants are getting one of them. And that's for the fans that haven't followed the draft very closely. Marvin Harrison Jr., who will more likely than not be the first receiver off the board. Roma Dunzier, the big wide receiver from Washington. And Malik Neighbors, the explosive wide receiver from LSU. Right. And depending on who you talk to, teams are going to have those guys in different orders based on their preference, what they need, their scheme fit or whatever. So I'm with you. I don't think what they did in free agency indicates they're selecting a receiver more than before. You know what I mean? Like, I we kind of thought this already. I don't we already feel, have. I don't feel more strongly about it. I just think the need was, we knew the need was there. The need's still there. And the fit's there with the value. Everything's there. It fits. Right. It just, it makes too much sense. It was like two years ago when we're sitting there, we're looking at Iki Aquanu and Charles Cross and Evan Neal, and you're like, they're going to pick an offensive tackle. That's what it feels like right now with the wide receiver position to me. Yeah, I just... Or go back when they drafted Andrew Thomas. When you look at Thomas and Werfs and all those guys, you're like, they're going to pick an offensive yeah. tackle. It just feels that way for a wide receiver. The need year. and the neighborhood value is just meshing so closely together, John. I, I just find it incredibly hard for me to believe that they don't take one. Now, if a quarterback they believe is the next... Tom Brady is sitting there at, at six. You obviously never pass up on that because the quarterback is the quarterback, and that's the way it goes. If you think you can get a future Hall of Famer at that position, I don't care who your other guys are and who your starter is or whatever. Right. You, you pick that guy. So that's always a possibility. But other than that, I would be extremely surprised if they did not walk away from a wide, with a wide receiver. All right, hole number two. I'll go next. I think it's obviously cornerback. Right. right? We know Deontay Banks is one starter. We know Deontay Banks is one starter. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, Cordell Flott's in the mix. You know, sure. Maybe in, maybe slot, maybe nickel, maybe outside. Maybe. I don't know if they're like a true believer there or not, but he did play in both spots last year, was effective at times. So that's one guy. Who's your other guy? They just brought back Nick McLeod. I don't think that's a guy you want to, you know, he's a good stopgap at that spot to be a backup and play there if you need him. I think you want to try to draft somebody to compete with him. Well, that especially other outside quarterback with how spot. important he is on specials. All that stuff. Because you, you would take away some of that, that juice. And you have Trey Hawkins there who can compete, but obviously, you know, small school, late round pick last year. They tried to kind of shove him in there early in the year, didn't work out. Maybe they'll give him another shot. 
He but was you, a little raw. You want, of course, he's a quarterback out of Old Dominion. It was raw. on day three. I mean, it what else? Raw. I don't know what people were expecting. So you want to add somebody to that room. Now, is it a nickel? I don't know. There's going to be plenty of day two right. nickel slot corners that get picked in this draft. The outside corners go dry a little bit pretty quickly in round two. So we'll see if a really good corner could drop to the Giants in round two. But however you want to you know, bake the pie, they will have to add, at least in my opinion, another cornerback in some way, shape, or form before the start. Totally agree, John, because there's not even a reasonable sure thing right now to play opposite banks, which is really what you're getting to. Aaron Robinson's trying to come back after missing a whole year. Yeah, you with can't a count serious, on that at all. serious injury. Yeah, you can't count on that. So you can't. Now, am I keeping him in the back of my mind? that I'd like to watch him at spring drills and see if there's a chance he can make it back? Because I know he's got the talent. No one gives up on his favorite no. draft prospects like Paul. No Patino. one gives up. No one the, does. Because when I see the skills in the toolbox, <laughs> I really hold on to that guy for dear life until until you have to cut bait. You should have seen him clinging on to Demontre you know? Moore at the end. It was, like a, it was like the kid holding on to daddy's leg when he the, tried to leave him at daycare. The skill set was so there, <laughs> but all those other intangibles were not. <laughs> Uh, He's he, you know, we've talked about this. He is from a skill set perspective. I'm sorry, this is funny. No, he's he's one of my all time biggest disappointments because the skill set was there and and all the other stuff was not and and he just turned out to be a total flame out. Robinson was a third round pick, and and is suited to be a boundary. I think right now it's a very long shot. That, that he's able to take the starting job. Heck, he might not, not even make the roster, John. Yeah. We don't even know that. We don't even know where he is with his rehab. Right. So those are the two gaping, uh, maybe gaping yes. strong, but those are the two well, obvious holes that I think we look at. Right. What other spots do you think there could still be additions or tweaks? Well, it depends on how thin you think the other spots are. Well, what do you think? Do we know what's going to go on with Darren Waller? I mean, I think that that st- seems to be up in the air. I would have would hoped if he was was going to retire, he would have told the team by now. But I mean, there 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 seems to be some questions there. Okay, but, so to yeah. me, that is definitely one of the other positions that you have to consider because it does become rather thin. We all like Daniel Bellinger, but Cager has not put a huge resume on the field. Uh, they just signed Stoll. We know he's a blocker. He's really not anything to write home about in the passing game. So how can you get excited about the tight ends room? Again, no disrespect to Daniel Bellinger. I like Daniel Bellinger. He's a good functional player. But, I mean, he's the only one that you actually can say has legit resume in that room. I'm going to go pass rushing defensive tackle. I think you need someone with a little bit of juice to play that three-technique spot. We were just talking about Aaron Donald, right? You want to have that guy with a little bit of juice at your three-technique spot. That's a spot that's absolutely you know, thin. They have a lot of tackles on the roster. Dexter, Nacho, Jordan Riley, yep. DJ Davidson, Ryder Anderson. But those guys more, I would put them into the big-body defensive tackle silo rather than the pass-rushing defensive tackle silo. You, you agree with that? I think that's fair, right? I think it is. So can you get that 290 to 300-pound defensive tackle that can, you know, cause some havoc in the interior of that defensive line to give you some of the pass-rush production you lost with Leonard Williams, who managed to get paid a lot of money again, by the way? That dude just keeps cashing in, man. Good he's for him. He's a really so happy good player. Yeah, he's a, and he's a good dude, by the way. And so I'm very he happy is. for him. Had a really great last month of the season in Seattle, yeah. too. Anyway, any other – those are two. Any other spots that you would still want to address? Well, I happen to be a bigger believer in Belton than a lot of people are at safety. Now, he has flashed – Every time he gets in there, he seems to make a play. No, safety's fair, Paul. Safety's on the list. Is is he is he good enough that if he's a full time regular down safety, that he can consistently do that over seventeen games? I think it's fair to question. And it's a different system. We just too. don't know. So we don't know how he would play in we don't know. this system either. So what's proven there? I don't know that that he's proven. I think that's a reach to say. You'd like to believe it, but I don't I don't think you could say it with conviction. Again, Javarius Owens is a guy they like a lot, but we don't know. And you mentioned the system, which is a great point, John. This is a different system they're going to play this year. As much as they liked Owens going into last year, 
maybe this year it's not a fit for him. And maybe Javarius Owens doesn't come off that red shirt year and give them anything. Now, I don't Joe know. Joe Shane has made the point that they try to draft guys that are system proof. So we'll see if he does. If that works or he not. He says that. So I think it's fair to say that that's a that is certainly a position that if you could address and get a very strong feeling of an upgrade, you probably would. Is that fair? Yes. And I would say, yes, I'm with you. I think safety's on the list. I I wouldn't mind adding another guard, to be honest with you. You know, you added Runyon, you have Luminor out there. Who's right. as much a starting guard as he also is your swing tackle, too. Like, he kind of fills both roles. Yep. So what happens then if, you know, one of the tackles gets hurt, he has to swing out the tackle, and then who's your guard? I know you have Zudu in-house, you have McKeithen in-house. But yeah. if you want to draft the guard here, you know, round three or four, I would have no problem with that. If you want to add another young player to the guard room. I don't think there's anything wrong with taking another, another prospect for the offensive line room because the Giants have already seen that your best laid plans sometimes fall apart. And you have to go deeper and deeper into that room than you were originally planned. So how could you go wrong if you draft another offensive line prospect? So if you had to guess right now, and then we'll get to your calls here at 201-939-4513. If I made Paul Dottino predict today, yeah. left to right, the Giants starting offensive line in week one, what would it be? Week one. You want to give mine first? Do you want to think about it? No, no, I'll, I'll, I'll give you mine. I'll go Thomas. I think Neil is going to hold off the, the charge. I think Neil's going to be the right tackle. Uh, uh, so I'm going tackles first. I'm sorry. That's Thomas right. and Neil. I think Neil will hold off the charge. I think. So now go left guard to right guard. Okay. I, think, I think you're going to look at Runyon at left guard. It would not surprise me if Illuminor seizes the right guard spot. And, of course, JMS is in the middle. Uh, that would be my guess, too. If I had to guess right now what it would be week one, that's what it would be. Yeah. I agree with you. Now, why am I saying that? To be frank with you, I'm just going to be brutally honest. The two young guys, Azudu and McKeithen, have yet to prove that they can stay healthy enough to win a competition. And Illuminor, That's number one. And Illuminor also said to me in the interview, again, check it out on YouTube, folks. It's a great interview that he would like to play right guard you know, next to Evan Neal and next to John Michael Schmitz. I saw a quote of that. To those young guys some confidence. So, so, and he's more comfortable on the right side than the left there's side. There's no doubt. Too. Correct. Well, he played right tackle for the Raiders last year and right. had the best uh, run of his career. And he's played more right guard than left guard, yeah. too. So, so, um, so that's number one. Number one is, is the, the, um, questions about the health of the young guys to be able to fully compete. And number two is the fact that the experience, the guile, the leadership, the knowledge of Runyon and Illuminor. Uh, that's going to give them an extra score or two as as the testing goes through during training camp. They're going to have a little bit of a leg up on those other fellas because let's face it, those young kids haven't put much on the field. Yeah, we don't. Do we know when Josh Azudu is going to be ready? He no, had a pretty serious injury at the end of the year. He did. Yeah. So you know that foot was nasty. It was. So I just that's the way I'm going right now, and I you know is that an upgrade? Yes, it is. It's an upgrade over over last year. It's better. It's better. It's not dominant, but it's better. Now, I'll just say this in general before we get to the calls here. And I apologize for taking an extra couple of minutes here, guys. You know, you remember what I told you from my priority was this offseason, right? Yes. How the Giants should address their offseason. Yes. Now, they did pivot away from that a little bit. You were big on pass rusher more than I was. I no, was... I was big on offense. Remember I said I put all the resources in the offense? Right, the offense right, player? but... I thought you also said pass rusher was was the other very high pick. You wouldn't have been Go, surprised. Going into free agency, I thought the two splash moves would right. either be pass rusher or um, guard. Those are the those are the two spots I thought there would be a splash. Correct. But in terms of my bigger picture off season plan, of okay, offense, all the resources, yes. the offense, 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 offense. Yes, the Giants did deviate that from that a little bit here, right? Well, you know, they, they made went, the trade. Right. They decide to prioritize. And if you're going to prioritize a position on defense... That's a good one. That's the one to do. If anything, <laughs> I mean, right now, the highest paid NFL player other than a quarterback is the defensive end, Nick Bosa. And when Michael Parsons gets his contract, he's going to be the next guy. Yes, he will. You pay the quarterback, and then you pay the guys that go after the quarterback, right? Yeah. So I get why the Giants did it, but now I feel like the draft, you're going to need some offensive players in this draft. Because if, if you don't walk away with that really good wide receiver and you compare the Giants' offensive skill group to the rest of the groups it around the league... It doesn't measure up. 
I agree. There's not one guy that teams again with Dar Darren Waller's health being the being the asterisk there. There's no one that teams at the game plan for. No, and headache, the, at least players, John. And at least last year they had Saquon. That was the Correct. guy you had the game plan for him a little bit, right? And that's what I talked about. That's the downside of losing Saquon. I prefer to take the money for a safety and running back and put it into a defensive end. But the downside is you lose your one headache player on offense, right? And you have to replace that headache on offense to yep. allow your offense to function. Even if the offensive line is better, I still don't think we see a group where you have, you know, it, this isn't going to be, you know, the 90s Cowboys here blocking in front of Emmett Smith, right? So is there enough there to score the amount of points you need to to win games? So you are going to have to add some offensive weapons here. Again, we talked about wide receiver already. Uh, in the draft and make that a bit of a well, priority. So all that's you, it. All you did was just enhance what we talked about at six, ten minutes ago. Correct. Because, again, as you start putting all the pieces together, you just have layer upon layer upon layer that tells you impact wide receiver at six is the smartest thing to do. And I'll say this. I think what we're seeing, and again, knowing Brian Dable's history is a play caller in Buffalo, the all recall the playoff game where he did not run the ball once in the first half. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Brian Dable wants to throw the football. He does. He and does. They draft, they signed a guard whose best feature is pass protection. Correct. And Jermaine Illuminor, I think, is a solid pass protector as mm -hmm. well. And Devin Singletary is not your, you know, put the shoulder into the line and push four not yards a bell in cow a back. of dust. He's not a bell cow back. You know, I, 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 I watched his tape yesterday, by the way. I was really impressed He's by good. it, to be He's honest He's a good player. You. Really elusive. Makes people miss in space a lot, even in small areas. But I think we're seeing this take on a Brian Dable, Mike Kafka from the Chiefs type of offensive feel where this is going to be more of a pass-first offense. So in order to be a pass-first offense, you need dudes to pass the ball to. So yeah. that's why I think receiver, 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 receiver. And as much as we know the receiver class is deep this year, Everybody says the top three guys are your blue chip impact guys. Guys that, that would be the first wide receiver taken in most drafts. Correct. And that's the problem. Because as deep as this receiver class is, and there may be a bunch of guys who turn out to be really good, there's probably a Puka Nakua sitting there somewhere in the third round. You know, oh, could be. Oh, they'll be good starters in, okay. going into day three. But right, Well, that's my, what I'm trying to say. But you want that absolute... Fort Knox, sure thing, impact guy, headache player. Well, as good as Puka, headache receiver. As good as Puka Nakua is. He's not a headache player. Is he Jamar Chase? No. Is he Justin Jefferson? No. Exactly. Oh, is he AJ Brown? No. Is he CeeDee Lamb? No. Exactly. And that's the point. That's the point. The headache player, you want the headache player, you got to take him at six. Done. 201 939 4513. I mentioned it already, but real quickly, go subscribe to the Giants Settle Podcast. We have interviews going up with all the guys the Giants have signed over the past few days. Really good interviews. The one with Brian Burns is already up there. The offensive linemen should be going up shortly, at least one of them, if we get that straightened away. Is that straightened away yet, Pierce? We're still figuring that one out. Uh, we're still figuring that one out. But if you can go to the YouTube channel to figure it out. Um, but it's there. So go check out Giants Huddle Podcast, Giants app, Giants.com slash podcast, or just search for Giants Huddle on your favorite podcast platform. By the way, if you watch and listen to us on Google Podcast, that's shutting down at the end of April. And you now have to subscribe via YouTube Music. That's how Google is doing their podcast feed now. Oh. So just keep that in mind. And we are on YouTube Music, so make sure you go subscribe uh, on there. Would it I, surprise you I knew nothing about that? No, not at all. I didn't think we so. We have three new callers, or three not common callers, not new, but not common okay. callers in line, which makes me excited. Then we'll get to as many as you can in the next half an hour, folks. So we'll try to go a little rapid fire here. Let's lead it off with Jake in Columbus, Ohio. Jake, what's going on? Hey, John. Hey, Paul. Thanks for all the content you guys do. It's really awesome. I listen to just about all of it. No, thanks so for I listening, Jake. We, Great. We appreciate you. Good to have you. Awesome. Um, so I have one question and one hypothetical, which I know isn't y'all's favorite, but figured I'd toss it in there. Um, That's fine. The question is, um, you know, the fit and the need match the value at wide receiver in the first round. I totally agree on that. But cornerbacks are super important. Um, you have to have two. A lot of times you have to have three nowadays. Agreed. Um, so where do you all see us getting that second one from? Um, is it Tredavious White? Is it a second rounder? If it's a second rounder, 
kind of do you have some names to watch in that area? Um, thoughts on that? No, great, Jay, great question. Great question. Could it be a veteran like Tredavious White coming over? You know, he got cut. He wouldn't even go in the compensatory formula. And by the way, for the people that follow that right now, I think the Giants are flat on the compensatory draft pick um, train from what I saw the other day looking it up on over the cap. I thought that they were a little bit ahead. Oh, yeah. I think the points, they have like a seventh round pick yeah. or something like that. I think a little right bit ahead. That. You're right about that. But we knew going into this offseason, Jake, that they would not be able to successfully plug every single hole to the extent you would want to plug it. They just had too many needs and not enough resources. And then on top of that, you go sp- trade a second round pick and spend, you know, $28 million a year, whatever it is on Brian Burns. Like that reduces your asset stockpile even more. Yeah. So I think you're going to have to. I don't think there's a cornerback there worth picking at six. Maybe Quinion Mitchell is probably the closest guy for me. He's probably going to be my number one cornerback on the board when all is said and done. But. I think you're going to have to deal with a second-round corner, deal with a veteran like you're talking about, like a Tredavious White, and you know, see how that works. And I think that's what you're looking at here for the corner position. And remember, this isn't the Wink Martindale defense where your corners are in a bunch of man-to-man defense. The Bowen system does protect your corners a little bit more. So it's not quite as vital, still a vital position, but it's not vital to the point that it was in Wink's system where... You know, you're putting these guys out on islands on one-on-one coverage all the time. You know, I would add this, that, you know, the Giants were very much involved in getting physical corners, press corners, you know, the, the kind of guys who are going to give you some trouble at the line. You're going to see a little more off coverage yep. with this new scheme. And there are guys who are better at off coverage than press and vice versa. The best example I can give you is Corey Webster. And I don't know how old you are, but if you go back a little ways, when Corey Webster came out of LSU, and of course we know he won two Super Bowls with the Giants, he was a press corner. They drafted him. Their defensive coordinator at the time wanted to play off coverage. It was a problem. Anthony, Not only did Anthony he, Lynn, right, was a defensive coordinator? Uh, 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 Johnny Lynn. Johnny, Johnny Lynn. Johnny. Johnny. Why did Anthony Lynn? And, yeah, and Lynn. so, you know, well, they had, a, they had a couple of them during Corey's yeah. tenure. But the problem was when you don't have a scheme fit, for the guy's best toolbox, then he just doesn't play as well as you need him to. Yeah. And that's that's the point that I just want to make. And it's a great example because then when he finally got out of the doghouse with all the injuries and and not playing the scheme like exactly like they wanted. Spags let him play press. Finally, Spags said, okay, go ahead. Get up to the line and, and start getting on people. And it worked. And he was really good. Yeah. He let the league in passes defense one year. Had over tw- it was 23, I think, one season. And you, you asked for some names. I'll give you some second-round names. If you want outside corner, TJ Tampa, Kamari Lassiter are two yes. second-round corners. Yes. Uh, Tampa's a bigger guy. Lassiter, he did a ran. I think the reports were a 4-5-1 mm-hmm. in the Georgia Pro Day the other day, which is fine. It's good enough. Um, and it's Rackish draw. I'm not sure if he's going to be there in the second round when the Giants pick. He's probably going to be gone. Yeah, I But think he would so be too. the upper echelon slot guy. Then you have, like, the, the, the Flournoy's, uh, Phillips... Uh, Max Melton from Rutgers is a slot guy that could be good. And he caught some some nice ups at the combine. He and, started moving up. And I really like Mike Sanford still from Michigan, who I think mm-hmm. is a really good slot corner, smart football player. I think he's a guy that would fit really well on Bowen's defense. So I would keep an eye on Sanford still in round two from Michigan as a potential pick. I don't know if you can wait till round three for him. That might be a little bit tight. I like him as a potential. If you're looking for a slot, I think he could be a round two pick. You know, the Giants are going to have to figure out what they really want to do with Cordell Flott because I think they know he can play. Now, John, we've had this conversation before. I've always said I think he's a better boundary corner because he's got length and he uses the sideline very well to his advantage. But his overall frame says slot. Yeah, and, you know, in his time playing, I've seen he's had good moments and bad moments at both spots. He has flashed. He hasn't been clearly better at either spot. I know. So they need to figure out, maybe the new defensive coordinator, Shane Bowen, has to figure out what what is he? And this is all part of studying that tape. Right. He's got to say, look, Joe, tell Joe Shane, Joe, this is what I think about Cordell Flott. This is how I would use him. And that may indicate where they're going to go. Jake, anything else? Yeah, um, I appreciate that answer. That that filled it perfectly. Um, so this, just a quick hypothetical. Again, I know it's not your favorite, but. No, it's um, fine, Jake, go ahead. 
Um, so uh, the Vikings seem to be gearing up to move into the top five to get a quarterback. So if we assume that four quarterbacks are gone, I'm curious, based on your evaluation of those top three wide receivers, and granted, I'm in Columbus, I'm an Ohio State guy, I love Marvin, is Marvin Harrison Jr. so much better than the other two that moving up maybe one spot to get him would be worth it, knowing that we have all those other holes to fill that maybe a fourth or fifth round could help fill? And I'll take this one off the air. No, good question, Jake. Harrison is my number one wide receiver. He's a, just to make it simple for fans, he's a 6'4 guy that moves like a 5'11 guy. <laughs> That's what he is. You want him to keep it really simple? And he has all the skills of a 6'4 guy with the movement skills of a guy that's 5'11. He's unbelievable. There's not really a lot of weaknesses there. He's really good. How about Lock All Pro? Does that do it? <laughs> Lock All Pro? That's a little strong. But I, 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 I think you feel good about it. Yeah. I would not. Um, you'd also need to have a dance partner there. Now, I did talk to some people at the Combine, and I was told by a few people that there are teams that have Adunze as their number one wide receiver. There are some teams that have Neighbors as a number one wide receiver. That is a thing. <laughs> so there's not, to me, there, there's, there's a, there isn't enough space between these three to justify trading up for one of them. They're I all really good. Whichever one is there, take them and be happy. Now, the problem is there is a gap. Until you get to number four. Yes. There is a gap from three to four. That is correct. Which okay. is why you worry about trading down too And far. why you need to get that headache player at six. Brian Thomas and that was using very He's really good. He's very interesting. He's really good. And he has as much. Like him a lot. And he has as much upside as the other three guys. Like him a lot. He's just not as polished as the other three no. guys. No. So you're going to have to deal with some growing pains there, you know? He is my fourth receiver. Yeah, I think, I think he's going to be my fourth. But, but there's though, a gap gotta, there. To be honest, A.D. Mitchell's right right on his butt. Right on his butt for me. He's in that second cluster. Those guys are in the same cluster for me. And I, and I think I'm going to have Troy Franklin on the, in like a slightly down. Well, you know how player. I like Franklin. I like Franklin too, but he's, he's just – the body type is just uh, – it's not I as good as the other. Like Thomas and Mitchell oh. are both, both – Six two plus, and they're over two hundred pounds. You know, Franklin's six one one seventy. I know. So it's, it's I know. It, that's why I think he's a little bit below. Franklin for me. plays bigger than he looks. If he was, if he was two hundred pounds, I'd put him in the same group. As I understand. Guys. So that's why I, I have them a little bit. And, 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 and I love Franklin, by the way. But and that makes me a little Tad Leary too. But you know, look, look at it this way. Yep. If the Giants. Did not get the receiver at six, and somehow Franklin was sitting there at the top of the second round for them. Oh, I would bingo. love to have one hundred percent. Jay in Phoenix, he's up next. Jay, hey guys, how you doing? Hello. Oh, you hear me? Yes, right and clear, Jay. What do you got? Whoa! Oh, we just lost him. What All right, Jay, you? call us right back, and we will get you back up. Yes, Jay, we could hear you until the dial tone kicked in. Just <laughs> for the record. All right, let's go to Randy in California. Hopefully, oh. you have better uh, luck with this Pacific time zone, fella. Randy, what's up? Hey, guys, how you doing? We're good. Hello. Hey, so I'd like to uh, play devil's advocate and put some uh, holes in, uh, like, Swiss cheese. I always agree with you guys, except for taking a receiver right now. Okay. Okay. So let me explain. Go ahead. Uh, so, Papa, could you, one of you guys please play Joe Shane for me? I'll Don't be Joe Shane. Who? Oh, I'd love to be Joe Shane. Okay. I oh, do, okay. I have to, uh, to lose you, about twenty five pounds and grow a lot of hair, but I'll do my and, best. And, and I know you're going to yeah. make a trade. You're calling him with a trade. Gonna, That's got to be it. Yeah, and of course. Paycheck, okay. By the way, and by the way, course. by the way, I had a paycheck. Yes, yeah. good point. Good point. I, I have said, <laughs> I have said, while I'm taking Odunze at six, I would listen to a trade offer because if I get totally blown away, maybe I'd I consider. So it's probably better than I'm Joe Shane, so I can drive a harder bargain. There you All go. Right, here we go. There you Brandy, go. Lay it on me. What do you got? <laughs> okay, if you're staking, if you don't take a uh, quarterback in this draft as high as you are right now, you're banking everything on Daniel Jones, injury prone. Right? He could be, and he came out and said it that they're concerned about his health. Right? Yeah. So him saying that right there is a red flag saying they got to get off of him because if he gets hurt again, that could end up your cap for the following year as well because of the injury uh, insurance on him, right? Randy, maybe I don't have – yes, Wait, yeah, he does, he, does have no, an, he, does, he does have an injury guarantee on the third year. That is correct. Right, right. Now, okay, so what you're saying is 
if we have a down year next year, and if there's not a quarterback and that it's not as strong of a class next year, there may not be a quarterback next year, right? After that. Okay. So you're looking at two two down years, right? Then you got a rookie, so you're looking at possibly three down years. Well, now, Randy, usually, right. can, can, uh, can I answer? Can I play the role here for a second? Oh, yeah. Sorry, guys. No, Go that's ahead. okay. No, no. I, 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 I don't disagree with anything you're saying, right? But mm-hmm. what happens if I can get Michael Penix in round two? Yeah, but there's a reason why Penix is so low, right? He's not a blue chip, top of the line quarterback. Well, right, but how how about this? Yeah, but Randy, what if a blue chip, top of the line quarterback is not available at six? But if you don't exercise every possible uh, trade scenario as far as giving up the house, the farm, and the goat, and the chickens to get those quarterbacks, right? You're staking your job saying if you have two to three more down years, Plus the season we had, usually it means somebody else is teaching that down the road because you got. That's all I'm saying. No, right? Randy, and, and I don't I don't your, disagree with you, Randy. I don't I don't I don't right. disagree with you. I am open. I am open right. to possibility. So what is what is your trade scenario for the Giants to move up then to get the quarterback you're talking about? If you don't move up to uh, try to move up at least one or two spots, try to talk New England and move uh, budging off, right? Well, yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be moving you, up. You, it wouldn't, wouldn't be moving up one or two spots. It would be moving up to three to New England spot. That's where you would have to go. Right. Correct. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And, and if you don't, if you don't make every effort possible, even if you got to give up, like I said, the farm to get that quarterback, if you believe that quarterback's going to win for you within the next two years. And what if you because don't believe? That, what if you don't huh? believe though? What if you don't believe? That these three That's quarterbacks are the be all end all like other people do. What if you don't think that? But you can also flip that around and say, but what if you miss on that? You you're cooked. You, you trade up. You, you trade, trade up and draft a quarterback right. who busts. You are in big oh. trouble. But no, if you do not do that, you're in big trouble because within two years of having down down seasons with Daniel Jones being released, picking up a quarterback okay. off the street and open a third or fourth round pick is going to uh, work out for you. Aren't you t- playing the same uh, dice game? No, no, no. I mean, there, there, there are, there are risks to everything here, Randy. There is right. no, there is no risk-free option in this scenario. It's just a matter of what risk you want to take. And Paul, before you make your okay. argument here, okay. Randy, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be uh, Elliot Wolf in New England. And now, it. and now you can be Joe Shane. All right. Elliot Wolf. Okay. All right, hey Joe. Um, I really want to trade out with the Giants here because I want to stay in the top six so I can get my elite wide receiver. But I don't want a quarterback. But I want to stay in the top six. But I got the Vikings bursting down my door. They're offering me two ones and two twos. I have um, I have the Raiders bursting down my door. Dude, that that Davis guy. He's offering me three number one picks. That sounds pretty good to me. Right. He's offering me three first rounders. So here's what I'm gonna need for me to move down to six, okay. Joe. I'm gonna need. Your second round pick this year. I'm going to need your first round pick next year. I'm mm-hmm. going to need your second round pick next year. And I'm going to need a third round pick the following year. Now, if you guys have been watching the movie The Draft too much. <laughs> what do you mean? If you know the movie, right? Well, I, I, yeah, I, I get it. I, yeah, I get it. I get it. Would you but do like that? I said, unless you... Would you do that? No. I would try to space out out a little bit. Right? I did. I, I did. A first, no, no. Not in a, but yeah, you not just not campaigned for a deal. He offered you a deal, and you backed out. No, because I wouldn't take that deal. No, but right? Randy, here's the thing. But it's going to cost Randy, you. Randy, real quick. If you're moving up uh, to three, the conversation starts with your two this year and your one next year. That's where it starts. And, it goes and then the high. question is right. that, what else are you giving besides that? And there'll be more than one other team that wants that pick, which is what he tried there, to explain to you. There's going to be competition for it, right? I, I would give you two number two, two number ones, and I'd give you a number three. So you'll give me. I would two need your, ones, and then the following year, uh, number three. I no no no. I would I I need I would need your number three this. I would need your third rounder this year, and then I will take okay. your 2025 one and your 2026 one. I, I do that. Yeah, I do. Okay. It. And you're doing that. All right. Now, that's fair. John, what I wanted to say to you is the other day I was talking about the casino and what the Giants have done. They've gone into the casino and they've split their hand because by signing Drew Locke, they have another young, experienced quarterback 
who hasn't played a ton in this league, who they think has legitimate potential, and with a quarterback girl like Brian Dable, who has a good track record with quarterbacks, they are now giving a little bit of a hedge on if Daniel Jones doesn't work out, they're, they're thinking right now that Drew Locke gives them a much better chance of maybe having a young quarterback who might work out better than, let's say, a Danny DeVito or an older Tyrod Taylor. Yeah, that, that This was a that, hedge. That's a dice roll, though, Paul. It is a dice roll. Everything is a dice roll. Yeah, but there are levels to dice rolls. This, this is another level of, of small protection that they have built into their risk. You know, yeah, no, I, I get it, but that's the equivalent of trying to pick the number on a roulette wheel. He was a very high number two draft choice. I under, I understand he wasn't that. a six. I, I under, he wasn't Brock Purdy. He was a second round pick. Yes, I a mean, high he, second I, round I, pick. I understand. He was, he was in the 40s. He was in the 40s. You know, we're not talking about a five, a six, or an well, undrafted rookie free agent. I mean, Paul, we didn't mention once about Drew Locke being a potential starter to be the last three years. No, and I, this I, don't th- I, don't, I don't think he is as it stands today. And I like Drew Locke. I think he's a good backup. I think if he has to play, I think he'll do a nice job. But you're not, you're not marrying your franchise to the guy. Not at all. Not at all. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is he's just another guy in the building who could potentially be a dark horse to help if necessary. Yeah, 100%. Which is good better, player, good which guy. Is better, I'm excited for him to be here. But. Which is better than, frankly, no disrespect to Tyrod Taylor, but Tyrod Taylor with his injuries and his age, Tyrod Taylor could not be considered a better fit under these circumstances than Drew Locke. Drew Locke is a better fit. I agree with that, but I think, and I and, uh, appreciate the call, Randy. I think the point Randy is trying to make, though, is... Big picture future of a franchise is basically married to the quality of the quarterback that you have. Best case scenario is that Jones pans out well. That's the best case for everybody. Of of course it is. And that whole scenario changes if QBs do start looking like next year in college football. Some players emerge. That's true too, right? Like, yeah, you have you. That's true too. You have Beckett, Georgia, who started, who looked really good end of this year. Uh, Jackson Dart's another guy that a lot of people like, but uh, Quinn Ewers, if you're a Quinn Ewers guy out of Texas, but Um, we heard at the combine, McCarthy was nowhere near the hype he's getting now. A year ago, yeah, no, that's true. I mean, all of a sudden, oh, he's now he's a first round guy. The look, so, Randy, who knows? I, I, I look for the fans that want to do whatever it takes to get the quarterback. I understand your thought process, and I'm not, I'm not blaming you for it. I'm not blaming you for it. And if you want to go that, if you, that's your preference, I totally get it. I understand that. Um, it all depends on what you think of, of of the player, and in terms of who's. That's why I hate this. Oh, just go up in three and, and and get the quarterback. We don't even know which quarterback it is. Which quarterback is it? If it's me. I will say this to you. For those who want to entertain that, if it's me, May is the only guy I would do it for. I would not do it for the other two guys. May is my favorite quarterback in this draft, and Bo Nix is my second one. Shocking. Just the way it is. It's okay. You're so predictable. Let's go to Anthony, New Jersey. Anthony, you're up next on Big Blue Kickoff Live. Hi, Anthony. Hey, guys. Uh, I haven't called since last off season before the draft, but I love the work that you guys do in the off season. Thank you. Um, I, um, I want to preface this first where I'm, I'm not a QB or bus guy. And yes. In fact, uh, I went in to look at the QBs in this year's draft because I was, I'm, I was, and I, I still am highly against trading up. I think this team has way too many holes and I don't think it's a QB away. Um, and people like to use the Eli example, but the team was in a much different place at that time when, when we made that trade. Um, but having looked at the quarterbacks, and I am a complete novice, but I do have a pretty good history at looking at quarterbacks, I think that J.J. McCarthy is the best quarterback in this draft. Why? And, and it, uh, <laughs> I, I, I wish I called before the, the combine because the combine kind of stole my thunder, but... The, the way somebody somebody actually had asked me, like, how do I do it? You know, because I have a good history of, of calling these quarterbacks. And I never really thought about it because it's just kind of like an eye thing, you know. And so I, I sat down and thought about it. And the way that I evaluate quarterbacks coming out of college is they have to be playing chess. For me, QB is the only position where you have to be playing chess while the other positions can get away 
with playing checkers, and then you have some guys who can play chess in, in those positions too. I guess my Meaning question for you, Anthony, is how can you tell which guys are playing chess when you don't know what the system's asking of them? Right. Okay, I'm going to try to make this quick because I, I don't want this to be like a really long answer. No, that's okay. But there's, Go ahead. There's, for me, there's three archetypes, right? You have the book smart guy, which is like Eli, where these guys can break down a defense better than even some of these defensive coordinators. They're they're going through their progressions pre snap already. Right? They they know how to read what's in front of them before it even develops, right? Sure, I agree with that. Then you then you have the opposite end of the spectrum, which is the gunslingers, right? Which is like a Brett Favre where they have a feel for the game and matchups and leverage, right? It's kind of like a subconscious thing. No, I agree with that. I, have, I, I'm, I'm with you on that. They have chemistry with their guys, and they rely on their guns to make throws that other people just can't. Then you have the, the guys that are in the middle, which is like your Mahomes types, which are the improvisers, right? These are the guys that manipulate the defense, right? The, it's kind of like sand, sand lot playing, right? You kind of fool defense to go one way, and you're you're going the other way. You know where you want to go with the ball. You make it happen, sure. right? Mm-hmm. J.J. McCarthy, for me, falls in that sort of Mahomes uh, area. I'm not saying he's Mahomes. I'm, uh, let me rephrase that. He falls in that improviser. Yeah, see, area. I see, Anthony, I disagree. I would put McCarthy into the first bucket. Like he can move around and throw on the move a little bit, but I like if you watch Mahomes coming out, he plays nothing like JJ McCarthy. Not at all. It's not it's not even close to a comparison. Not at all. And by the way, McCarthy no, no, McCarthy not... has so little experience, by the way. It's only two years as a starter at Michigan. And and you could tell yeah, after, you know, with, with only those amount of games. And again, I, I'm not comparing them in terms of quality of prospect. I'm just talking about play style, Anthony. They're not the same. I, I would put McCarthy more into that first bucket than I would into the third bucket for me. Here, here's, here's, here's what you look for then when you watch the tape, right? McCarthy, the way he throws with anticipation, the way that he uses his eyes to shift the defense to where he wants to go, right? He is extremely accurate. The, the thing that I don't like about McCarthy is his actual throwing motion. He kind of throws like a shortstop, which I think messes up his deep ball, the the touch and and velocity of his I deep ball. I agree with that. Where I actually, think that's fair. But, but where it actually helps him is on the move, right? Where he's a for me, if you if you compare how he throws off platform compared to Caleb Williams, for example. Caleb Williams relies on his arm a lot, which then throws off his accuracy. Whereas McCarthy, because of that mechanic, like kind of like throwing like a shortstop, right? He still has, he still can throw from his core and, and his body, and, and so the accuracy is still there. I think McCarthy you know? throws very accurately on the move. I also think Caleb Williams is the most accurate on the move thrower in this whole draft. Yeah, I would. I disagree with that. I think a lot of people are gonna are gonna be surprise for me dude I, I literally one. i watched every snap kayla williams took this year he's extremely accurate trust me extremely accurate i'm not all right let me let me ask you a question let me ask you a question yes since since 2020 uh and i'm not including the last three years because there's been uh you know that's the rookie class uh, still on their first contracts there have been 60 first round quarterbacks taken and only 29 of them have gone to a Pro Bowl. Now, that's not the end-all, be-all. But if the NFL executives in this league literally have a 50-50 shot with a first-round quarterback going to a Pro Bowl, then they need to get your phone number and call you because obviously you know more about quarterbacks <laughs> no. than they do. No. And I'm not, no, no, I'm I'm not, not kidding. Why? <laughs> then what? I'm not saying that at all. But, but, that, but that's, that's a track record now over almost 25 years. Yeah, he's allowed to have his opinion on a player. No, but, okay. what, no but what I'm saying is... It's it's a crapshoot. I mean, it's literally just under fifty percent of first round quarterbacks have gone to a Pro Bowl. I, the bust factor I, is huge. Can I tell you why I think that is, Paul? Sure. I think I think they're overdrafted. I think, guys, I think that's what it is. Go ahead. I think guys. I think guys overdraft trade, right? So, like for me, example in this year's draft is May and Penix. I'm not going near them with a barge pole. Because my number one requisite is you have, and to me, 
May is downright erratic at times. He relies on his arm too much. And Penix, Penix is playing checkers. He's running, for me, he's not really, really reading the defense. He's running the play. He's running the offense. And if it's not there, he tries to force it in. He's, it, 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 all, all, he doesn't, you don't really see him move from one side of the field to the now, other. Anthony, all, I would they, uh... I would argue, mm. and then real quick, because I have two more calls I have to get to. I'll, I'll give you my response, yeah. and then you can give me one more comment. I think this has been a great call, by the way. I think you make some good points. You've, you've thought hard about this, and I appreciate somebody calling up with really detailed opinions on why you've they think it. You've taken some time to think I about really it. I really appreciate that, Anthony. Really good call. I think recently it's actually been the traitsy quarterbacks that have worked out. Yeah, right. Josh Allen, traits guy. Mm-hmm. Justin Herbert. Traits guy. Mm -hmm. Patrick Mahomes, traits guy. Anthony Richardson, traits guy. These are all traits guys that have hit. Now, there's been non-traits guys. Like, I wouldn't necessarily consider Joe Burrow a traits guy. He's worked out. But, like, Josh Rosen wasn't a traits guy. That that didn't work. Tua has been good. He hasn't been, I don't think, like, you know, all world. You'd rather have, you know, Herbert than Tua. They were picked back-to-back, obviously, right? So, I think it's actually been the – in recent history – Mm -hmm. And I think going back further, I think it flips a little bit. But I think in recent history, it's been the traits guys that have worked out more so than than not, no? I I think what you're getting here is you're getting more quarterbacks, more athletic quarterbacks coming through. So the it's not that they're working out because of their traits. They're working out because they still have these qualities that I'm talking about. They're either on the, you know, the, the three archetypes. Josh you know Allen did it. Well, I, I honestly don't know. I can't, I have no comment because I, I didn't really look at the quarterbacks in that, okay. in that draft class, mm-hmm. you know. So I, I, I really I only know what, what he's done in the, the NFL. Fair what enough. I'm saying, I'm not, say, I'm not saying you don't want the trace guy. Like, if you could get the trace guy with the, the, the you know, and he's playing chess out there, then that's, that's Mahomes. That's of course. perfect. You yeah, know but you know what? But you in have... college, Anthony, just to be clear, in college, Patrick Mahomes was not playing chess. He was playing checkers. Right. He was just yeah, chucking I, the ball all over the place. So right. he, he's, developed, I, I he's developed into a guy that plays chess, but in college, he was not playing chess. Here's my last point yes. real quick because I know this has gone long. That's okay. Um, you can't you you can't teach speed, right? Right. You can't you can't teach the instinct that I'm talking about. I agree you can't with that. Develop that. No, I, I agree you know? with that. And, I think mm-hmm. you're right. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the last thing. Thanks, guys. No, Sorry. great. No, okay. Anthony, great call. Appreciate you calling in. Interesting no, call. Th- thoughtful call. Yeah. I no. That. And, and 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 that's that's good conversation. Uh, no matter if we disagree on some of the points, it's it's good back and forth. And I agree. I do think there is, if you can find the guy that in college already is reading the game that way and can oh, process that's like that wonderful. pre and post snap, I'm with you, Anthony. If, if you can find that, you go get that guy. And See, that's more important than a guy that can throw a few miles an hour faster, throw a few yards further. I agree with that. I just think it's... Like, did anyone really know that C.J. Stroud could process and play chess the way he did based off what he did at Ohio State? No, of course not. Nobody knew that. The Panthers didn't know. <laughs> Most people had Bryce Young as a number one quarterback. Nobody yeah. knew. I think I'm with you, Anthony, on your theory, I, but I think figuring out which guys are able to do the things you're talking about is really, really hard. Well, this is one of the reasons, and, and not all of the Parcells quarterback rules still apply because the game has changed and the economics of the game have changed where uh, you know guys come out early and you can't necessarily get all of the things that Bill wanted back in the day. But he was very big on guys who graduated, which you never get anymore anyway, very big on guys who had uh, three-year starter, started right? at least yeah. three years mm-hmm. and guys who won – you know, at least 30 games. Because not only did you want a guy who had all that experience, but you wanted a guy who had a lot of winning experience. These these are things coming into the pro game that will give you a leg up. And for a guy like McCarthy, who's been a two-year starter, that to me is one of those yellow flags. Yeah, you're also going to argue that gives him some more room to grow. You can. Yeah. Well, and that's that's when we were at the Combine, that was one of the things we talked about, about guys who transferred, played under a bunch of different systems, wound up staying five and six years in school. The positive 
is that they've shown the mental maturity and the versatility to adapt. And of course, all that experience. The negative is maybe their ceiling isn't going to be quite as high. Yeah. So that's that's kind of a coin flip too. Yeah, and look, in terms of McCarthy, and I've said I like the top three guys in this draft. I will take any one of those three guys. Well, he's not one of the top it's... three for me or anybody, right? I'm, I'm, I'm not. Let me finish. Sure. I like the top three guys, and if any of them was sitting there at six, I'd have no problem picking them. I think they're both. I think all three have the talent and ability to be star NFL quarterbacks. I like J.J. McCarthy. I've gotten through. It's funny at the combine. I said I've gone through about eight of his games. With all the free agency stuff, I've gone through about eight of his games. <laughs> right. I have not finished him yet. I was going to do it this week, and then the Giants signed a bajillion guys. Yes. So I'm going to finish him next week. I think he's a good player. I know we're going along, Pierce, and I apologize, but we're going to get to our last two callers here. He's a good player. I think what he does on third downs is pretty impressive, and those are like the gotta-have-it plays, mm -hmm. which he didn't have a ton of because they were always playing ahead of the sticks with the run game. They were always playing with the lead. So I look at some of those third and longs he was able to convert, and I'm like, all right, that's pretty good. I think he's very accurate intermediate. I think he's willing to throw over the middle, which I think is essential for a good quarterback. I think he's very accurate on crossing patterns, which is something that Brian Dable uses over and over again in his offensive system. It's just crossers on crossers on crossers. So I think all that fits. But if, if you're giving me the choice between one of those top three receivers and McCarthy, I just think the three receivers are that much better of a prospect. But if I'm sitting there and you're saying, would you pick J.J. McCarthy or Brian Thomas? I think that's a different conversation. You know what I mean? If the Giants are picking at 12, mm -hmm. now McCarthy might not be there. Right. But I'd be more amenable to that just based on where he's going to land on okay. my board. Okay. I just have trouble passing on a true blue chip player for a guy that I don't consider a blue chip prospect, even at quarterback. And I get for fans that want to do it to do it. And by the way, this is the same exact thing I said about Daniel Jones. Remember, the Giants picked at 6 and 17? What did I say? I'd be okay with it at 17. I don't think I could do it at 6. I, I and thought, that's, what, that's what both of us said during yeah. that draft process. Oh, I know. I know. I know. So I thought he at 17 he was possible. I didn't think at 6. And then it comes into play about the other factors that we talked about. Right. And they're like, well, if we didn't get him there, we weren't going to get him. Sometimes you just got to make a pick because it's the only chance you can Correct. get your guy. And again, maybe that's the way the Giants will feel about somebody at six, and that's what they do. I don't know the answer to that, but that's my – right now, as I stand today on March 15th, that's how I feel about the McCarthy. Pack. I warn you about this, and this has nothing to do specifically with the players themselves, but it's about the environment. It was unanimous – Everybody and their mother insisted that Dwayne Haskins was a top ten pick. Ah, I don't know. About that. I don't know about that, but okay. No, first round. Top, pick. top, top fifteen for sure. I I know people in New York were Giants have to take Dwayne Haskins. Well, the red flags were all over him from the very beginning. Lack of experience. Played with professional receivers. Played with a professional offensive line. Never had to bring his team from behind. There was so much missing there, but people were just enamored with the way he threw the ball, uh, his, his strength, um, supposedly his ability to, to lead an offense because they were so incredibly, unbelievably efficient at Ohio State. It's easy to get sucked into that stuff. It really is. And people have been sucked into that stuff many times. That's why less than 50% of first-round quarterbacks yeah. have gone to a Pro Bowl. Done. Don't get angry. <laughs> Nothing to be angry about. Let's finish up. All right. Jay and Phoenix, we lost him before. I want to make sure we get him in. Jay, what's going on? Hey, guys. Yeah, I wish I could blame Pearson for what happened earlier, but it was completely user error. <laughs> no worries, man. What do you got for us? <laughs> well, I... Um, I was going to chime in on the conversation about the receivers, and I, I actually think that that's what the Giants are doing, is they're maneuvering things to be able to get the choice of the receivers they want. Because um, I do kind of be I do believe them that they're going to give Daniel Jones a shot. And if they draft a quarterback, if one of the three aren't there, they're going to go later and get maybe a developmental guy that they can have behind Locke and, and DJ. But my main question that I was calling about was, um, with the Shane Bowen's defense, 
I'm trying to envision who's going to be on the field and how it's going to work, at least in the, 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 the front guys and the, the linebackers. We haven't talked to them yet, so we don't know either. I mean, I look, I, look, I think in, in your basic nickel package, which is what you're going to be out there 60 to 70% of the time, you're right now you're going to have uh, Thibodeau and Burns outside. You'll have Nacho and Dexter Lawrence as your two tackles, and you'll have McFadden and Okereke as your two linebackers. I, I'll tell okay. you, you know who I'm curious about? We loved him. We loved him. Darian Beavers coming off of a, a year on IR. I wonder how he fits into this mix. Paul still yeah. grabbing onto those prospects. Another guy who I yeah. love coming out of school. I'm, I don't give up on guys easily when I know they've got the toolbox. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. waiting to see what Beavers has to offer this year. And if it's not nickel, do we? So I appreciate that info. But yep. if it's not nickel, do we see? Does Azizo Jalari have an ability to play with Kayvon and Burns on the field, or is he strictly a pass rusher? I see him as Can more. Of a, I, I would almost more more consider putting Aziz as your pass rusher and putting Kayvon out there as your Sam. I think Kayvon has a better chance of being a guy that can drop in the coverage a little bit and play that strong side linebacker spot okay. than 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 Ojolari myself. Oh, I don't okay. see Ozolari doing anything in coverage. Yeah, neither do I. Yeah, okay. All right, well, very good. Appreciate it. You guys have a great weekend. Yeah, no problem. And I think, I don't know who the other outside linebacker would even be in that situation in a standard 4-3 set. I don't have an answer for that. Maybe their base would be more 3-4-ish and they'd do it that way. I don't know. That's mm-hmm. actually a good question. Yeah. That's something we'll have to watch for come OTAs and see where guys line up yep. and try to figure it out from there. I think this is the first time we've heard from Charlie in Portland, Maine since... The Combine, if I'm not mistaken. Charlie, what's going on, man? It's a long time. <laughs> hey, guys. How y'all doing? We're good. Hi. What's going hey, on? Paul. Hey, Paul. Yeah. Uh, you know the 50% of the quarterbacks that don't make a Pro Bowl? Well, we got one. All right? Going on six years. Right now, that's it's true. Time. That's true. He is one of the 52% <laughs> that haven't made one. That is true. Yeah. You're right. It's true, right? Look, I, uh, you know, what I – look, I – Actually, on Sunday, I broke that we were going to trade for Burns, right? I had a source who came on my space. You know, it's true. Okay. And he said that they offered the 47th pick, and they had the best offer of any team, and the Panthers were thinking about it. We had to go to the 39th pick to get it done, uh, but they got it done. But I would not have spent my money on Burns, $30 million guaranteed, $90 million guaranteed, because it doesn't matter what our defense does. I mean, we only score 16 points a game. So our defense is going to have to keep people to 14 or 15 points for us to win, right? That's no, a fair we point. Have, fair point, Charlie. I would have put the money on our offense. I would have got ourselves, like, Hunt, a guard. I know we got a lot of money, but I would want a guard who's going to be a cornerstone on our offense for years to come. The two guys we got... They're better than what we had, but we only gave, what, a two-year deal? Um, and we can get out of it after one year? Well, Charlie, so, look, I'd say this. I think Hunt's a better player than Runyon, but I don't think he's twice the player Runyon is, which is basically the difference in their he salaries. He got big money. It was $20 million versus, you know, half of that. That's a big, big chunk of change. But I would have spent the money on the offense, and I would have got another really good tackle, but... Instead of the defense, because our problem is that. our offense has scored 16 points a game. And even if we get a really great wide receiver, we've tried to do that the last five years, bringing in playmakers. It hasn't worked because we haven't had the quarterback. We have to take the quarterback. And, John, we don't have to move up to three. We just have to move up to five. And J.J. McCarthy will be there. Or one of those four top quarterbacks will be there. So we only have to, because Arizona is going to take Harrison. It's pretty, you know, that's who they're going to take because Murray needs them. And so all you got to do is move up one spot to the Chargers, and then you can get J.J. McCarthy. If that's I'm the guy moving that's up to draft McCarthy now. That makes no sense at all, Charlie. Charlie, None. look now. Look right. now. Look if 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 people believe that he's if they believe he's the guy, moving up one spot's worth it to do. I I yeah. don't I don't I I'm just telling you from my personal analysis I don't view him that way. Well, the thing is Minnesota does because they're going to move up. That's why they got the draft picks they did. Yeah, but how do you uh, how do you know they're moving up to draft McCarthy? Well, that's 
what I've been hearing, the sources, is they are, they are in fact... From, from his Panther it. source. His yeah, Panther but, but source told maybe, them that. Maybe they think the Patriots are getting out of three. Yeah. Uh, no, Patriots are picking a quarterback. I'm up here in New England. There's no way in hell they're not picking a quarterback at three. They need a quarterback. I agree with you. If I'm the Patriots, I'm picking one too. But there's a lot of noise out there that they're not going to do that. I don't know. No, they are going to do that. They're picking a quarterback. What I'm saying is, is is that if we don't pick a quarterback, look, I know what the Giants are going to do. I know what Shane's going to do. Shane's not going to pick a quarterback at six. In fact, he'll pick a wide receiver or he'll move down a couple of spots if he can, get more draft capital, pick a wide receiver there, and then in the third or fourth round, he'll pick the developmental guy. That's what he's going to do. Okay. So that's what I see. And there's a lot of logic in that, Charlie, an awful lot. But I think that's a big mistake. We need a quarterback. Yeah, but Charlie, if Joe one, Shane doesn't think J.J. McCarthy is a significant upgrade over Daniel Jones, why would you do that? I think he – oh, no. I, I think he does. I think he believes that there's, there's four quarterbacks. How do there's you know four. what he's thinking? Because I have sources that people know in the building <laughs> that they like four quarterbacks. They like four. I tell you, Paul, now, Charlie, you, Paul, you, 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 you might fall. You, you might, no, Charlie. You, you can you, laugh all you want, Paul, but I know a lot more than you do. Oh, okay? Maybe about the comic books on the shelf. That That's possible, oh, yeah. okay, Charlie. Paul, Come on, my friend. How many uh, quarterbacks have you been writing on? on? Like Come on. Come on. Come on. Give me a break. How Davis about Josh Webb. Allen? You thought he was the and best, And Donald. Right? And all the other busts that have been taken in the last and, 10 and if years. You, and if you Come like on. Knicks, then I know that's the guy I don't want. Because your pick on quarterbacks have been horrible for okay. years. Okay. All right. Sure. Right? It has. You like Daniel Jones. Where, where, where's that got to? That's all. See you guys. Right. Good day. <laughs> that was unnecessary, Charlie. That was a little nasty. I'm not going to lie. It's all right. Hey, I'm... I'm I'm here to face every mistake because no one's 100%. Former Broncos <sighs> tight end Chris Manhurts is signing with the Giants per Adam Schefter. According to reports. Okay. Trying to load up on that spot here. Another tight end. That's interesting. I wonder if that they know something. Uh, it, it certainly looks like uh, they're leaning in a certain direction, stuff in that room, doesn't it? Who knows? He's, a, he's another more of a blocker, though. Yeah. Charlie, good call. There's no reason to get personal with people, though, please. All right. It's okay. Thanks for being with us, everybody. For Paul DeTino, I'm John Schmoke. That's Big Blue Kickoff Live. Enjoy your weekend. You got some bonus content today. And, again, check out the John Settle Podcast. We'll have those interviews going up all week long talking about um, all the new members of the Giants. It'll be great interviews. Check them out on the John Settle Podcast. We'll see you on Monday, everybody.